Hello, and welcome to the Multiple Sclerosis Association of America's live webinar, MS Research Myth Busting, Addressing Common Misconceptions About Research and Clinical Trials in Minority Groups. My name is Peter Demiri with the Multiple Sclerosis Association of America, and MSAA is very excited to be co-hosting tonight's webinar with our friends at Accelerated Cure Project. So at this time, I would like to welcome to the program my co-host, Ms. Holly Schmidt of Accelerated Cure. Thank you, Kyle. We're excited to be here. I'm excited to be here tonight. Um, we are a research-focused nonprofit. We have a biobank with samples from people with MS, and we also have an MS registry and research network called I Conquer MS that's open for everyone to join. And uh, we noticed in our own research efforts that they are not as racially and ethnically diverse as we would like. So this program tonight is part of our efforts to understand why in MS, and actually in kind of all medical research, um, it isn't as representative as everybody and what we can do about it. So we're excited to be here. Thank you so much, Pete. And um, I'll hand it back over to you now. Great. Thanks so much, Holly. So as Holly mentioned, tonight's webinar is part of a campaign organized by MSAA and ACP on better understanding minority populations within the MS community with a specific focus on the importance of clinical trial research. I would like to take this time to thank our sponsors, Biogen and Genentech, for supporting this webinar, along with a series of in-person educational programs on this very important topic. Also, as Holly mentioned, MSAA and Accelerated Cure are two nonprofit organizations, and you can see here information about our programs and services, as well as Accelerated Cure and their mission and activities. Tonight's webinar is going to be archived on MSAA's website, which is mymsaa.org. As you're watching the program tonight, we encourage you to ask questions about the presentation by typing them into the chat box that's on your screen. Holly will be coordinating the Q&A session that will be at the end of the program, and we'll certainly try to fit in as many questions as time will allow. Also, if you do have any technical questions with the webinar, please type in those concerns into the chat box as well, and a moderator will get back to you. At this time, I am very honored to introduce our guest presenter, Dr. Mitzi Joy Williams. Dr. Williams is a board-certified neurologist and fellowship-trained multiple sclerosis specialist. She is a leading expert in understanding MS in underserved and ethnic minority populations and is dedicated to raising awareness about the importance of research participation and encouraging diversity in clinical trial research. Dr. Williams, thank you so much for being here. We're very excited to have you with us and presenting on this very important topic. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, and thank you to MSAA and ACP um, for inviting me to be a part of this program and talk about this very important topic um, that is very near and dear to my heart and also I think very important for the MS community. So you'll see just an overview of a little bit about, of about what we're going to discuss this evening. So we're going to talk a little bit about MS and minority groups, just a very broad overview. We'll talk about what research means and some survey data that um, we obtained uh, concerning uh, some of the attitudes about research. And then we'll talk more specifically about some common myths and misperceptions about research and about what happens when people participate in research and what are some of the benefits of participating. So I'm very excited to get started, so let's jump right in. All right, so what do we know about MS in minority groups and what do we need to learn? And the short answer is, a lot, but let's talk about a few specifics. So I was very fortunate to participate in a research uh, paper uh, that we published in 2015, myself and a group of my colleagues, where we really looked at some of the issues uh, about MS in certain minority populations. In this particular paper, we focused on the African American and Hispanic American populations because those are the two largest minorities. Um, and basically, what we did was a literature review, and we found that out of nearly 50 or over 50,000 articles that had been written in English about multiple sclerosis in general, 
there were very few that focused on minority populations, and it really represented less than 1% of all of the literature on multiple sclerosis. And so even though that study was published in 2015, if you look at the newer uh, data, uh, some of us looked this up more recently, there are a little more than 200 articles now about African Americans, but still it's a very small number um, of articles and very little information compared to all of the literature that's available on multiple sclerosis. So that emphasizes one of the reasons why this is important. And then another reason why it's important is because there are some studies that have been published starting in 2012 and 2013 looking at the incidence or occurrence of MS in minority populations or overall in the U.S. And so this study was published um, from a VA, from the Veterans Administration, and looked at the incidence of MS in the United States. And if you see the areas that are highlighted, the first one looks at the total um, incidence in the total white population, which was about 932 but if you look at the total black population, the incidence is 12.13 per 100,000. Now, if you look at the total numbers, the total numbers are higher in the white population versus the black and versus the Hispanic population. But if you look at the occurrence of MS, it's significantly higher in the African-American population, and primarily that's driven by the black female population, which is 20, in which the incidence is 26.4. Uh, 26.34 versus 25.79. If you look at the Hispanic population at the bottom of this graph, the incidence is about 8.16. So it's lower in that population. Um, but I think that there's a lot that we can learn from, uh, from groups where there's a high incidence of MS, like why does it occur as much in that group versus a low incidence and why does it not occur in that group. And I think one of the important things about this research and the reason that it was such a shock to much of the MS community is because we generally thought that the incidence of MS was very low in African American populations. So this really disproved that theory. So what else do we know about MS in African Americans? If we look at the data that is available, although it is small, it still is valuable, um, there are suggestions that there is a more aggressive course of disease, meaning there is more disability earlier on. Uh, there may be a shorter time to walking disability, six to 10 years earlier in some studies um, than their Caucasian counterparts, meaning people may have to use a cane or some type of assistive device six to 10 years earlier. There seems to be more visual impairment, more difficulty with vision and poor recovery from relapse, relapses that involve visual problems. And there also appear to be more lesions on MRI. Interestingly enough, however, there seems to be an earlier time to starting treatment. So many people may ask, well, Dr. Williams, maybe the outcomes are worse because people are waiting a longer time to go to the doctor. When in fact, some studies have suggested that there may be an earlier time to starting treatment because the symptoms may be more severe when someone starts having symptoms. So if a person maybe has numbness in a hand or an arm, it may be misdiagnosed as a pinched nerve. And of course, with MS symptoms, they often go away within a short period of time. So people either may not go to the doctor or they may go to the doctor and they may not follow up. However, if you have, for instance, one whole side of your body that won't move or if you have a leg that's dragging, you may seek medical attention earlier because the symptoms may be more severe. And then also in terms of issues of access to care, there were several studies published um, in 2008 and 2018 suggesting that African Americans are less likely to see a neurologist, so less likely to have specialty care and access to different diagnostic treatments um, that may be available for their MS. In terms of the Hispanic population, again, as we look back at that graph that talked about risk, the risk overall is lower, but there are some characteristics that are different or distinguish them from the African American and the Caucasian populations. And so there appears to be a more severe course of disease. Um, they are also are more likely to have visual impairment um, or vision trouble at the beginning of uh, onset of disease. They also may have spinal cord lesions, and sometimes those lesions are very long, um, like what we see in similar diseases such as uh, neuromyelitis optica. But that's a, a specific characteristic in the Hispanic population. And also they may have younger age at diagnosis. So um, there's a group of many of us um, who are interested um, in helping understand MS in minority populations, including physicians, um, their advocacy partners, there are industry partners, and patients. And so the, uh, we have this really great coalition called the MS Minority Research Engagement Partnership Network, and we conducted a survey to find out 
what are people's attitudes about research? Because it's very common knowledge across many specialties of medicine um, that we don't have enough enrollment of uh, people of ethnic minority groups in our research studies, which certainly affects our results and potentially affects our ability to generalize the findings that we have in these studies. So we did a research to try to find out um, what are people's attitudes toward research and how do they feel about it. So we surveyed about 2,600 people um, of many different ethnic backgrounds. And so we asked them some questions, one of which was, what do you think about when you think about the term medical research? And these were some of the words that come to mind. So people often talked about finding a cure for disease. Um, they talked about better medicine. They talked about clinical trials. Um, they also talked about um, treating the disease, um, improving conditions, um, and having options. So there are a lot of positive um, thoughts about research. Some people also talked about testing. Um, possible money was one that came, work, um, and treated. So there are a bunch of different um, thoughts that came to mind when people talked about research. And when you break this down a little bit um, further, we looked at kind of the tone of the answers um, that people gave when they talked about research. And we can see here in the far left column that the majority of folks, at least half, in just about all of these groups, so the dark purple being the non-Hispanic black population, um, the lighter purple being um, the Hispanic population, the middle kind of blue being the white population, and then um, all others were in the uh, orange. And we can see that about between 45 to 50 percent of most people had some type of positive tone to their answers when asked them what they thought about research. And then we see another 35 or so percent had neutral uh, thoughts about research. So between those two, that makes the overwhelming majority of our responses. Um, there certainly were some negative responses if you look a little further over to the right, but overwhelmingly the majority of people did have a positive thought about clinical research. Now, let's talk about some of the myths and misconceptions about research which may impact um, some people's reasons to participate or not participate. So one myth is that research subjects are treated like guinea pigs without any rights. And so there is sometimes a myth, um, especially in the African American community, uh, where people may fear being treated like a guinea pig. And certainly there is a long history um, of uh, research and misjustices that have occurred in the African American community here in the US. Um, but certainly, um, you know, one of the things that we try to explain is that you do have the right to be fully informed about your research study. You should know why it's performed, the potential risks and side effects, how that type of care differs from the standard of care, and what other options are available. And so I think the important thing is to engage in the process. So you can uh, ask any questions that you want to about the study, and then you can also take time with your family or other doctors to talk about the research study before you um, decide to participate. And the other very important thing I think that's not emphasized is that you can withhold your consent to participate. So if, for instance, you are involved in a study and for some reason something happens, you don't feel comfortable or the treatment um, is not working, you can withdraw from the study and you can leave at any time. We certainly encourage people who are involved in studies to continue continue um, you know, as, as long as possible, but that is an option. So once you're in a study, it doesn't mean that you don't have the right to be without your consent. Um, so that's a very important um, myth and misconception. And what's another myth? My doctor is only telling me um, about this study because it will get paid if I sign up. Um, and so some of these myths came out of a different focus groups that we conducted um, where we talked to people about research. I talked to some of my patients and some of my colleagues talked to theirs. And these are some of the issues that came up. And so you can ask your doctor about the financial support for the study. There are very few studies where a physician may be paid a certain amount for each person that enrolls, but more often um, people are given resources to help conduct the study. And it's not necessarily the more people you enroll, the more money you get. Um, and so that's a very common misconception. And so you can ask how the funds are being allocated, and then you can also have a conversation with your doctor. If you feel uncomfortable about the financial aspects, you do not have to join the study. Um, so those are some of the things um, that kind of combat that myth. And then here's another myth, especially um, which is uh, pertinent to MS. If I join a research study, I might get placebo instead of real treatment. In the past, many MS drug trials were performed comparing an active drug, meaning the new medication that was seeking approval, to placebo, meaning no medication. And that was because initially there weren't very many treatments available for MS. 
But now it is very well understood that treatment of MS is important and that everyone needs to be treated as early as possible with disease. So there are very few, almost no placebo-controlled trials. Um, the, the most recent placebo-controlled trials that were conducted in MS were in areas of MS or types of MS where we did not have treatment. So, for instance, we just had our first treatment approved for primary progressive MS a few years ago, and now we have treatments approved for secondary progressive MS. So in those cases, there were placebo-controlled trials because we did not have drugs approved for that type of MS. But now we have drugs approved for just about every type of MS, so we should not have placebo-controlled trials for the most part moving forward. Um, and so most of our studies now are compared to what we call an active comparator, which is another approved therapy for multiple sclerosis, and there's, uh, there's very commonly everybody's on some type of treatment. But again, these are all questions you can ask your physician, and you always have the right not to join a study if you do not feel comfortable with the requirements. And here's another myth. Research is dangerous and nobody's looking out for my safety. Now, we never want to downplay the risks associated with research. There certainly can be side effects with different types of procedures and with new medications. Some of them are ones that we anticipate, and sometimes um, when medications are given to a larger group of people, we may see side effects that we did not anticipate. So we never want to downplay that, but we do want to emphasize that there are many, many safeguards in place to try to ensure um, that the trials are conducted as safely as possible. And so this is a really cool graphic that really shows basically the progress of research when we're talking about specifically for a drug approval. So there's a preclinical phase, and that's often where medications are tested in animal models. And so basically the goal of that is to kind of see how the medication works, how the medication may be metabolized, and some of the potential side effects. But as we all know, humans do not operate the same way that animals do. And so that's where a phase one trial may come into play. So a drug has to be approved after the preclinical studies to be tested in humans. So you can't just go from rats in mice to testing in people, there has to be approval for that type of testing. So the first phase is called phase one, and as you can see, it's a very small number of people, so 20 to 80 people participate in this study, and again, we're looking at the safety of the medication and also kind of how the medication works in the body. And then if uh, that trial shows positive results, then we move to phase two. Phase two is usually 100 to 300 participants. And again, we're looking at safety, okay? So we're looking to see what side effects occur. And then we're also looking at efficacy or effectiveness. So we want to make sure that the drug has a positive effect and that it does hopefully what we um, want it to do um, in that population. And so phase two, if a drug um, meets the endpoints or meets the uh, goals of a phase two trial, then it's approved to move on to phase three. Phase three are the large clinical trials that often lead to approval of medications or procedures. So now we're talking larger numbers, 1,000 to 3,000 participants, um, and again, looking at safety, um, looking at effectiveness, um, and looking at side effects. So all of those things are measured in each phase of research, and you have to basically pass the test or meet your goals in one phase before you can move to the next phase. And then um, usually phase three trials lead to the approval of medications. For most of our MS therapies, they have at least two phase three trials. So they have to conduct at least two large trials um, before they're approved. And then once they're approved by the FDA, the safety monitoring does not stop. So again, um, if there are new safety issues that arise, the FDA can review those and can adjust or change the medication's label and update it. And also, many times there are what we call phase four trials that occur after a drug has been approved, and so they often have multiple participants and look at many different measures, including um, different side effects, how to mitigate or decrease um, different side effects, how to titrate medicines, et cetera. So the research almost never stops, and so if we start back at phase one, oftentimes people who start in these early studies will continue on in what we call an extension phase. So they may be followed for very long periods of time. So by the time a medication is approved at the end of this phase three, there may be people who have been on the medication and taking it for five years or seven years or more before it actually is approved. So there often is a you know, significant period of time where people are taking the medicine um, before it actually gets approved.
So also another myth, joining a study means that I will have to try a new drug. And the answer to that is not necessarily. So one thing that I think is very important to emphasize is that clinical trials or medications or procedures are only one way to be involved in research. There are many different ways to be involved in research. So there are some surveys that can be conducted. There are certainly registries, such as the iConquer MS registry, which is listed here. There are different types of um, biobanks that look at um, different biomarkers in the blood or in the spinal fluid. Um, and there are also studies that look at imaging. and, and also, studies that look at things like diet, exercise, mindfulness. So there are many different ways for people to be involved. And clinical trials are not for everybody, but there is a way for everybody to be involved in research and contribute to the body of knowledge. What's another myth? I don't qualify for studies because I'm too old, too disabled, or I have other medical conditions. And so this is a very common myth. And again, there are often very strict um, criteria to be involved in clinical trials. So in the case of clinical trials, sometimes people may not qualify, but again, that doesn't mean that you can't be involved in research at all. And so there are, uh, as I said, many different studies that are available, registries, biobanks, um, and then this is a great uh, resource for people looking for um, different research studies, and you can kind of write that down. Um, my MSAA has information about clinical trials. And we'll also have some other uh, websites uh, listed at the end of the, the talk. Okay. So is research participation right for you? So some reasons that you could consider participating in research. One is you can help determine what happens with MS, and maybe you can also help determine what doesn't help. So as I said, clinical trials for drugs are one part of that, but certainly there are other therapies um, like yoga, acupuncture, there are diet and lifestyle interventions. Many people ask me, Dr. Williams, what type of diet should I um, be using? Is there a certain type of exercise? So there are studies looking at these things, and then we can understand understand if these things are helpful or, or not as helpful to people living with MS. Also, there are studies looking at different innovative ways to deliver health care. So is telemedicine a good way to deliver MS care? Is it helpful for patients, especially those who can't um, make it to appointments or may not have transportation or may live very far away from their um, doctors? So um, there are different ways that you can help determine what helps with MS. Also, another reason to be involved in research is that you may help find a way to prevent MS in the future or cure MS. What we don't understand a lot about is risk factors for multiple sclerosis. Um, there are many new studies looking at different risk factors such as obesity, um, such as um, uh, smoking and vitamin D levels. And so when we have a large group of people involved in these studies, it helps us to understand what puts people at risk and also maybe what may be protective in these populations. So you can help us find a way to possibly prevent or predict who may or may not get MS. And so it also can help us um, identify MS earlier, potentially, if we know more about some of these risk factors. Reason number three. You can help improve the outlook for your community. And this is a pie chart just looking at um, MS research in general. And we can see that 95% of those um, who participate in clinical trials are white. We can see uh, about 3% Asian and 2% other. So that includes African Americans and Hispanic patients. And so there are very, very few people involved in clinical trials, so less than 1% in most of our studies. The average number of patients involved in our large clinical trials for multiple sclerosis ranges from 10 um, to about 30, um, which is not good, especially in light of the fact that we know now that the incidence of MS is higher in African Americans here in the U.S. Um, so there's a lot of work that needs to be done to improve those numbers so that we can understand um, if our medications are working effectively in all populations um, so that we can understand if there are any specific side effects that may be more prominent in one group versus another group, um, but also um, so that we can make sure that people are getting the same access um, to uh, cutting-edge medicine as well. Reason number four, there certainly may be personal benefits to participating in research trials. So certainly you have access to cutting-edge treatment or new treatments before they become available to everyone else. Often, um, in for most of our large trials, access to care may be free or lower cost. 
Um, you may have more frequent and thorough health care visits, so you may see your doctor more frequently so they can address issues when you're involved in a research trial. They don't neglect your other uh, issues. Um, and so you may be able to see your physician or see the physician more frequently and have some of those issues addressed. Um, and also you gain additional knowledge about MS and your own health status. Um, so again, this has to be weighed versus the risk. Um, but certainly it's something to consider when considering being involved in research. So what should you expect as a research participant? So there, just like there are stages to drug approval, there are also stages uh, to being involved in clinical research. So the first stage is what we call informed consent. And generally, uh, the research uh, coordinator will come in with a very, very long document. So your doctor or a healthcare professional will talk to you about it, and then they'll have the coordinator come in. Informed consent is a very long document, but again, it tells you all of those pros, all of those risk benefits like we talked about in that first slide, um, how the treatment in that study may differ from the standard of care um, and what you can expect. And so that informed consent process is very important because that's a great time to ask a lot of those questions that you have. Also may be a time where you can go home, look over the document, um, come back to your doctor and talk about it again. So after informed consent, then there is what we call screening. And screening is a process by which we look at the criteria for the study and make sure that you fit those criteria. Um, and then if you're eligible for the study, um, which is the next one, study eligibility. So if after that process the screening is done, it's determined that you're eligible for the study, then you're what we call randomized generally to different groups. And randomization means that in a study, if we want to try to get accurate results, for instance, in a drug trial, we may have people go on to one therapy or another therapy, and the researchers don't know um, which therapy you go on. So basically, that's a process called randomization. And so after you're randomized to whatever group, then you participate in those activities, whether it involves doctor's visits, whether it involves different blood draws, whether it involves, involves medications or MRIs being done. If you participate in those activities, generally most of our large clinical trials last a year to two years. Some of our interventional studies don't last quite as long. And then after that, you follow up, and then eventually the results of the studies are published. Um, one of the areas that does need a lot of improvement in the scientific community is that we do not as we should, report back to those who are involved in the trials um, about what happened during the research study. And so that's something that definitely needs to be improved because if you spend your time, we should report back and let you know what happened and what those results were, whether they were positive or whether they were negative. So things to think about and to ask um, if you're considering being um, involved in research. One is what are the time and travel requirements? Um, oftentimes there are visits that are much more frequent than your regular doctor visits. So um, what kind of time is involved if you live far away? How often will you have to come to the clinic? Um, does the study fit into your work schedule or your other family activities? Um, you also want to ask about reimbursement for expenses. Sometimes there's reimbursement for, let's say, gas um, to come to the meeting, or sometimes there are other um, payments that may be given to participants in the form of gift cards or what have you. You can ask about those type of things. Um, very important is to ask about the possible risks, right, um, because we want to understand before we're involved in research what the potential risks are, what the potential side effects are, um, and then what will help the research or, or what help will they provide if something happens to you as a result of the study. And finally, another important question to ask is do you have to make any changes in your lifestyle to be involved in the study? So do you have to do any specific diet or exercise? Is that something that you think is feasible for you um, to continue involvement in that study? So where can you find information about clinical research? This is particularly important because some of the uh, results of the survey that we did not publish were that, I mean, that we did not talk about in this um, presentation were that many people wanted to be involved in research, but many said that their physicians either did not suggest it to them or they did not know where to find out about studies in their area. So these are some very good resources that you can access um, through the MS Association, uh, the MS Focus, which is associated with the MS Foundation, also the National MS Society, and then there are other general um, websites such as um, Smart Patients, Research Match, I Conquer MS, and the MS Minority Research um, Partnership Network. So these are all places that you can look to find out about research studies that may be conducted in your area. 
If you uh, see an MS specialist um, at an MS specialty center, oftentimes there is research that's being conducted at their center and that may be listed um, somewhere in the clinic. Or, you know, if you have an academic center in your area, um, they're often with an MS center, even if you don't see an MS specialist, there often are clinical trials being conducted there. But it's very important to find out ways um, that you can be involved, and these are things that you can do on your end to look up some of the studies in your area related to you um, or related to, you know, your family members. So I guess I finished just a little bit early, um, but I will pause here, um, and I thank you all for your time and attention. And I guess we will open it up for questions, and I think Holly is helping to uh, guide our question and answer session. Yes, yeah, yeah, thank great. you. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams. Uh, this is Peter. I just wanted to say thank you for that excellent presentation. Uh, it was a lot of great insights and really helpful information. So uh, I noticed there were quite a few questions that came in. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Holly, and she's going to run through the Q&A session. Thank you. Um, and people in the audience, uh, I hope you can figure out how to type in a message. Um, and you may be able to see the messages that people have already submitted. And that's how we can see your questions. So if you have a question, um, please type it in and, and hopefully we'll get to it. So um, one question for you, Dr. Williams, um, is how can somebody find research studies for African Americans if there are specific studies for African Americans or maybe for people in other groups as well, if you could address that. Yeah, so that's a great question. So there's not a really good mechanism to look uh, for studies specifically related to African Americans with MS. I will give a plug for um, a project that I've been working on with several of my colleagues for the past year, is that we're looking to actually start, or we're in the process of actually starting an African American MS registry. Um, that will be a nationwide project. And so once we get that up and running, um, certainly we, our goal would be to list some of the studies that are being done that are pertinent um, to African Americans with MS. Um, but currently, so the short answer is currently there's not a way to specifically look up those studies. Um, but certainly when you look up kind of general studies about multiple sclerosis, you will see the ones that may apply um, in your area that are looking specifically at African Americans. And I don't know if you had anything to add to that, Holly. Um, I think um, the National MS Society may have uh, specific information about registries that are um, for specific groups, so that might be a place to look. And mm -hmm. also um, on the Accelerated Kid Project page, and maybe we can find a way to post these links. Um, there is a, a place for people with MS. Uh, is part of the Minority Research Engagement Partnership Network, and I think we list some um, research opportunities there as well. So mm -hmm. um, we can get that out to people. But and by and large, yeah, there are a lot of ways to find clinical studies and clinical trials. And if you, um, you know, maybe type in specific search terms, that will get you closer to what you want to offer. Um, another question Absolutely. is, oh, this is an uh, interesting question, do individuals typically have to pay to enroll in a study? Right, so that is a great question. So the short answer is no. So people do not have to pay to be involved in research studies. Um, generally, uh, it's something that is either done, as I said, through your doctor's office or on online registries, and all of those registries are free. So if it's related to MS research, you do not have to pay to be involved. And in some cases, as I said, depending on the type of study, they may give a small stipend for travel or they may give gift cards for travel or what have you um, to you for participating in the study. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, another question is what DMT, disease modifying therapy, has been shown to work best for Hispanics? So the short answer is there is not one um, that has been shown to work best for the Hispanic population. Um, and again, you know, I think when we talk about the, the goal, I think we first need to make sure that we understand. So the goal of having people involved in research is certainly to understand more about MS in general. I think the more people that we have from diverse populations involved, we, we understand more about MS in those specific groups. Um, with the medications, um, there are sub studies that are done to try to look and see if the drug is equally as effective in one group, you know, for instance, a Hispanic group or an African American um, 
patients versus other patients, but there's not one necessarily that's been shown to be most effective. Um, and also the difficulty, even with many of our efforts to try to show that the drugs work equally as well, is that we still have very, very small numbers of people involved in these studies. Um, so it's something that we need to work on, um, but we do not have a drug that specifically is known to work best in African Americans or best in Hispanic populations, like what you would think of with maybe hypertension and things like that. So we don't have that for MS yet. Right, and I think that also some of the clinical trials um, they might ask people for racial information, but not necessarily mm -hmm. Hispanic. Um, right. So sometimes we don't even have the data to be able to tell. Um, Absolutely, and that's something that's being worked on, yeah. Okay, um, another question is uh, about any ongoing trials or research on reversing the damage to the affected nerves. Yes, so great question um, and one that's very commonly asked. So there are trials that are looking at agents. So, so as we look at the treatments that we have available for multiple sclerosis, most of them currently are um, approved to try to prevent further damage um, and to try to prevent new lesions on MRI, et cetera. We are now looking at a couple of new measures. So some of the newer measures that are looked at in more recent trials are Number one, can we achieve something called NIDA, which is no evidence of disease activity? So we're, we're definitely moving the bar in terms of our goals. We're trying to see, can we stop all disease activity, meaning no changes on MRI, no progression, no relapses with our drugs? There are also measures in our newer trials looking for improvement to see if people actually improve, which is something that we never really looked for in our earlier trials. Um, but also to answer the question, there are some trials looking at medications to see if they can reverse um, or regrow the myelin. Um, there was one medication that was very promising and unfortunately it did not meet its endpoints for the clinical trial. We were all very disappointed. But there are certainly several others that are being looked at to help with remyelination. And then there are certain procedures also that are being looked at, such as stem cell therapy, to try to see if they potentially could reverse some of the damage. So we're not yet, there yet, um, but there are definitely many people working on um, trying to see how we can reverse what's already been done. Uh, excellent. Um, here's a question about uh, being in a research study and what happens. Um, it says, when somebody is enrolled in a study, do they have a contact person they can connect with for the duration of the study, such as the researcher or somebody on the investigation team? So how does that work? So great question. Um, so all of this, sorry, all of them are great questions. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yes, so the short answer is yes. So there generally um, is a research team. Usually there's a research coordinator. Um, there are research staff members, usually nurses or other uh, staff members. And so there usually you would have um, one of those staff members as your contact person if you were having issues. It just depends on the center uh, where you're doing the research trial. So you would have one of those staff members who would be your contact person. If you were having issues, you would give them a call. Usually it's one of the nurses. Um, tell them if you're having any issues related to the medication of the study. Um, and they will also be the people to contact you to remind you about appointments, um, and kind of give you results if there are any pertinent results that you needed answers to. Okay, good. Um, another question is, is there a study to see why African Americans get MS later in life? So the short answer is I do not know of a current study that's looking at that specifically. Um, Again, looking at the registry that we're looking to, uh, the registry that we're in the process of setting up, we will be looking at some of the risk factors related to multiple sclerosis. But even if you're involved in other registries, you know, there are many efforts looking at different risk factors for MS, including why certain people develop MS at different ages. And so that will be something that will be looked at in a, um, in a general survey or a general uh, registry study, but something that we're specifically also looking at um, in our registry once we start enrolling patients um, early next year. Okay. And I guess I should just ask you, um, how will people find yeah. out about the registry once it starts up? Yes, um, so there'll be a big, um, definitely a big social media push. We will probably also, you know, um, you know, talk to some of our community partners about um, 
you know, kind of disseminating information about that. Um, but hopefully we'll be able to start enrolling um, first quarter of next year. So we're in the finishing stages of having, so the study's been approved. Um, we're just in the finishing stages of setting up the website, actually. Okay. And we should let people know, uh, Dr. Williams, that you have a very active Facebook presence. So I do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So, so it. Yes, yes. So you can, yes. Yeah, so actually, you can follow me on social media. Um, on Instagram, I am the Nerdy Neurologist, um, and also on Twitter, I'm the Nerdy Neurologist, and on Facebook, Dr. Missy Joy MD. And so I post um, a lot of information about these topics. Sometimes I also have I also have a YouTube channel where I talk about research and different topics. Um, and certainly, the information for the registry will be posted there as well. I highly recommend following Dr. Williams everywhere she is. <laughs> <laughs> I say busy. Well, good. Okay, um, another question is mm -hmm. from a disabled veteran who was diagnosed very recently this, this July and separated mm -hmm. from the Air Force in 2008. Um, and they want to know, have you heard of MS showing up in veterans at an alarming rate many years after discharge from service? Right, so there are often very many questions around risk factors related to MS, whether you were involved in the military. I have some folks who ask about Agent Orange. There are people in certain communities who ask about maybe other environmental issues that may have been related. We don't have a good handle on the environmental factors that may or may not increase the risk for MS. I would say generally we found that MS is a lot more common than we previously thought, so not just in veterans, but Overall, so the MS Society just published um, information suggesting that there were a million people in the U.S. who have multiple sclerosis, and before that, we were thinking there were less than half of a million. So uh, MS is a lot more prevalent than we previously thought, and we're not sure of the factors that are related to that, but certainly I think we're seeing it increasingly among many different people, um, not necessarily just veterans, but many different people from many different walks of life. Good, good, good. And um, one other question is, what about research on those over 65, the aging population, um, having to do with treatment efficacy, um, but also changes in disease processes? And this is another group that we don't always hear much about. So what do you, what do you have to say about that? Absolutely. Absolutely. So there are many efforts now to look at MS in uh, our more mature population, I say mature because as I think of old, the older I get, the further away old sounds. <laughs> so now like 90 years old to me and anything under that is pretty young. Um, but certainly um, there are efforts looking at um, what happens with treatment after a certain age. We do know that the immune system ages over time. So there is a great deal of concern in our populations over 65 if the medications that we're given um, over a certain age, if they may cause more harm, um, if they may harm more than help. And the, the honest answer is we don't know the answer to that, um, but there are many people that are looking at what we call immunosenescence, which is aging of the immune system. There are also several large studies being conducted in different centers. I know there's one at Cleveland Clinic, I believe, or at Mayo, where they're looking at um, what happens if people stop treatment at a certain age. Um, this MS truly, what we used to think about MS is that it burns out over time and that people just don't have that much activity. And so there are people that are looking into that to really see um, what happens with the disease as we age, but also um, if the treatments are effective. And there are many pushes from advocacy groups and others to try to um, broaden our criteria for our trials so that we include people who are over the age of 55 because MS affects many people in their 60s and even in their 70s. Uh, so their efforts to try to broaden the criteria so that we um, go above the age of 55, but also to see what happens with treatment and what happens to the immune system as we get older. Yeah, we hear um, at Accelerated Cure Project, people asking us this all the time, um, you know, why mm -hmm. can't I enroll in studies? I'm too, you know, I don't meet the age qualification. And these are sometimes right. for studies it's not even a treatment, it's just an informational right. stuff. It makes no sense. Right. So why not make it right. so possible? So. Right, so I right. and I think it's unfortunate. I think that the thinking behind it is that whenever you do a study, you want to try to get a population with as few what we call confounding factors as possible. And generally, as we age, we have 
other conditions. We may develop arthritis or diabetes or hypertension. Um, and so basically people try to get a younger population because they are less likely to have some of those other issues that may affect results. However, what we do know is that in the real world, <laughs> there are people um, who are living over the age of 55 who have those conditions, and we need to know how our treatments and interventions affect everyone. Um, so many of us are really pushing to try to make sure that um, we're much more inclusive, especially with age, um, as we're seeing more and more people living into their 60s and 70s with MS than before. And I imagine your registry will be open to anybody um, regarding Yes, absolutely, age. all ages. Absolutely, all ages. Good. And a couple more follow-up questions about the registry. Sure. Um, if you could uh, say the name of the registry again and also... Um, some of the plans for it. What do you hope to do with the information that you get? Absolutely. Um, we'll give you, yeah. Absolutely. So it's the National African American MS Registry, MAMSAR. Everybody likes acronyms. <laughs> that will be the, uh, the acronym, and AAMSR. And so I think the goal of the registry really is to to first gather information about the natural history of MS in the African American population. I think one of the big issues, um, and there actually is, I think on a couple of slides ago, there was one that talked about the Alliance for Research in the Hispanic Population. There's a similar effort um, with Dr. Liliana Amescua, I'm going back, I can't quite see it this minute. Yeah, so the Arms Alliance for Research in Hispanic Multiple Sclerosis. Um, and so the goal of the registry really is to gather information. One of the bigger issues that we have is when we look at these outcomes, looking at, um, you know, the fact that people may have to use um, canes or walkers earlier in the African American population, there seems to be more um, severe outcomes, we really don't know how much um, access to care is involved in that, and that's not something that's really re measured in many of our other um, studies or research efforts. And so it's really kind of understanding kind of what is happening. Is it that people may initially have access to care and lose access to care? Is it that people can't um, stay with their neurologists? Is it that people lose insurance? Um, it, what are some of the risk factors? Are there some that may be unique? I think that nobody really has looked at the African American population on a large scale like we're attempting to do. So we really just want to understand how MS behaves and some of what are the potential unique challenges in this population. Um, and then eventually, you know, certainly we may look at conducting studies where we look at genetic background and things of that nature, but primarily we want to understand how MS is really behaving. And one of our goals that we think is very important is to make sure that we're providing feedback as much as possible to those who are involved so that you have an idea of what's going on, um, that you know that there's value to what you're doing, and also that you know um, what's happening with the data that you are giving us or the data that you're providing. Um, so those are our hopes to start, um, and we just really hope to, um, you know, reach as many people as possible so we can help understand why MS is occurring so much in this population and what are some of the unique challenges that we need to address. Great. And I guess the question that I'm curious about is as an MS mm -hmm. specialist, somebody who's a yes. patient in yes. different groups, um, if you have an African American patient um, who's seeking treatment or have has questions mm -hmm. for you, um, mm -hmm. you know what kind of challenges does it pose that we don't have the right information or you know the same levels of information that we do um, for all the different racial and ethnic groups? Okay, so the last part of that question one more time. I'm sorry, Holly. Yeah, what kind of challenges as a as a right. clinician or a specialist right. does it pose? So we don't have all the all the evidence mm -hmm. that we should have. Right. Everybody. Right. So I think that it definitely poses challenges in terms of you know what are the right things to do in terms of treatment. Um, I think it also poses challenges because even though this information that we talked about in terms of incidents being higher in African Americans and that there may potentially be a more aggressive course in African American and Hispanic populations, although this information is pretty well known among the MS community, we also need to make sure that that information is available in the general neurology community. So, for instance, I was able to um, develop a series of educational programs along with one of my colleagues um, for um, patients and for physicians just talking about some of the data related to African Americans and MS, and literally every office I go into for general neurology, they're like, wow, I never heard of this, and even in some MS specialist um, offices. And so I think that, um, 
you know, the challenge is that we have to make sure that this information is available um, and not necessarily um, so that everyone will put African Americans and Hispanics on the most aggressive medications um, available, but so that people will at least be mindful that there's the potential for some people to have more aggressive disease. Um, and so that definitely is a big challenge is making sure the information is available in the general neurology community and then for us as NS specialists, making sure that we're applying the information that we have um, in the right ways is also a challenge, which is why we need better, um, higher quality information to help inform our treatment decisions. Excellent. Well, I, I don't see any other questions coming in um, from our participants who have raised uh, a lot of really great questions tonight. So thank you all um, who have submitted questions. And I think at this point, Ms. Uh, Dr. Williams, unless you have anything last minute you'd like to say, I'll hand it back over to Pete now. Yeah, I'd just like to say thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, everyone, for your time and attention. Um, my message to um, everyone and whenever I do these programs is to get in where you fit in, right? So if a clinical trial is something that you can participate in and are interested in, by all means, it's important to seek out that knowledge and be involved. Um, but if a registry or something else is more appropriate, um, by all means, get out there and be involved, you know, because it's so important that we make sure that everyone's voice is heard and that everyone stand up and be counted so that we can make sure that what we're doing reflects what's happening in the real world. And so I appreciate um, your time and attention this evening, and thank you so much. I'll hand it back over to Peter. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Williams. That's a great message to end on, and we thank you, uh, MSAA and ACP. Certainly, uh, thank you for your time and your expertise and your great insights uh, on this very, very important topic. And we uh, have this uh, program that has been uh, supported by Biogen and Genentech, and we thank them as well. And as a reminder, we've been posting through the chats, and I'll mention it again, that we will have this program archived on MSA's website. It'll take us about a week to get it uh, recorded and archived, uh, but please check back and we'll have it on our video site as well as our YouTube channel. And we also invite you to take a very brief survey at the very end of this program uh, that will immediately follow this slide uh, that uh, will recap uh, questions about this program and also ask feedback uh, for any topics uh, you would like us to see addressed in the future on MS. And with that, I, again, want to thank Dr. Mitzi Williams. I want to thank Holly Schmidt. I want to thank our supporters, Biogen and Genentech. And I want to thank everyone who gave us their time today and listened and participated in this webinar. Have a great evening.